So this fantastic story of fire and blood was the session right after our last adventure which saves us most of a recap. However something did take place outside of the game. We played the game every Sunday, and we have a group chat where we can coordinate, talk and share the occasional meme with one another. In this group chat, probably around Thursday or something, I posted that I didn't think the GM was capable of killing off Hersknit Selnazi. I'm taking that as a challenge, was all he said in response. After that I knew that I done fucked up, so I had to mentally prepare myself for this session, because the GM's words, and some sort of sixth sense told me that if I wasn't careful, Hersknit Selnazi would die this session. My Nazi senses were tingling if you would. The session began with us back in the summer camp. The girl who played Mackenzie decided to take one of the other campers as a character. This one was a girl named Susie who was unusually good with a rifle, and was basically our assassin. The president, Gobbledick's old player, decided that he was going to be a hobo named Hobo Joe that we found in Through the Woods. Joe was a rather interesting character, who was predominantly a melee character, and armed with a fire axe, two combat knives and was quite good at making and throwing Molotov cocktails. Anyways, back to the story. Our gang of misfits started looking through some of the books and writings that we stole and couldn't make heads or tails of anything, because none of us had any skill with the occult. So, we decided to head into a fairly large town that was only a few miles nearby. Before we drove there, Buddy discovered that one of the other camp counselors was in fact an imposter. After a brief session of interrogation we discovered that the guy was a member of the cult, and had been spying on us for a while. He laughed in our faces when he said that he already sent word to the cult, and that they'd never stop hunting us. Connie then decided that he wanted to give the children a fun activity, so he ordered them all to get knives, forks, stakes, sharpened sticks, or anything like that, and had them gather in the main gathering section. We then tossed them the cultist, bound and gagged and told the children to have fun. According to the GM, after a week of being told violence and murder is okay, and receiving Connie's training, the children swarmed the cultists like a band of angry sharks. Connie was so proud of the kids that the merciless slaughter brought a tear to his eye, so after scarring over a hundred children, we decided to leave to go to the town, where Hobo Joe knew of a professor of the occult lived. At this point, we still had my Pinto cruising wagon and Chuck's van. Remember that, we arrived in the town and immediately got to work trying to find the professor, who Hobo Joe had met in a Costco. As you could imagine this wasn't easy, particularly when one of the people asking was dressed like an African warlord and another in full SS attire. Eventually we got a lead when a local bar owner said that the professor frequents it every night with his wife. That's when we decided to stake it out. Unfortunately for us, we didn't see the professor until the cultists arrived. We didn't notice them at first. They weren't dressed in the white jumpsuits like earlier. They wore normal civilian clothes. We watched from our cars as they pulled a dazed elderly couple out of a bar, each with what appeared to be head wounds. We ran out of our cars to try and help them, but before we could, two of the men pulled out assault rifles and fired on us. I and Senator Fister took a couple of shots, but overall we were alright. Our party was pretty heavily fucking armed after all. We took the professor and his wife, and set them in our cars. After all the stuff we've seen, we all agreed that driving back to the camp alone at night was way too risky, so we rented out hotel rooms a few blocks down. It was a rather stressful experience, even inside of the hotel. We kept looking out of the windows and noticing the same few cars constantly driving by, and a group of people were staring at us all night. Didn't exactly need to jump to many conclusions to assume that the cultists had surrounded. We gave the professor and his wife some over-the-counter painkillers to help them concentrate, and eventually they came out of their dazed state. When the professor woke us up and saw that we were most certainly not his would-be captors he was so thankful that he was willing to help us in any way possible. We showed him the texts and drawings from the books that we stole and he said that he recognized them in some of the artistry and stories from some of the local Native Americans. Additionally, he could roughly translate some of our texts. He said that they were prophecies and esoteric ramblings about something only referred to as the god in the lake and about how he requires servant. So after telling the professor about the cult to this god in the lake, and how they'll do everything in their power to kill him because he's the only one within hundreds of miles who could help us stop them, he seemed to go into a rather worried state. Clearly the lazy shit has never had people try to kill him before. We spent the entire on watch for the cultist. We figured that even they wouldn't dare risk exposure unless they absolutely had to, and we were completely right. It was around 8am, before everyone else got up when I was watching the cultist, 
I decided to act in the Sknitzel Nazi way, because we needed a way through. I headed down to the parking garage where my car was and got out every stick grenade I could carry, as well as another Panzer Skrek and 4 rockets. I also took extra Luger and Sturmgeur 44 ammo with me, because I figured that after last time, the GM would want that car, and all of its goodies destroyed, and I needed to stock up. This parking garage had two exits to it, and thanks to my reckon, I noticed that the cultists were patrolling both of them, just as damned good soldiers of the Third Reich were. Hesknet Selnazi said aloud. I went to the north exit, which was larger and had a few more cultists guarding it. Figured that if I was going to do this, I'd do it where the most cultists were. Four rockets later, I had successfully obliterated their cars, all but one of their members, and severely damaged the road, making it nigh useless. I put the weapon back in the car, and immediately ran up to my hotel room, where staff and guests were clearly freaking the fuck out about the four missiles that just went off outside, exactly as planned. I threw open the door to our room and yelled at everyone to get going immediately, because the cultists cars just suddenly exploded for some reason. We all reached our cars, and I specifically told Buddy, the driver of Chuck's old truck, that he was to follow me, no matter what I did. When I got into the car, I gave one of my Panzer Forsts to Suzy, who was riding shotgun, told her that if there's anything blocking our way, she was to shoot it. Gave her the Panzer Force because the young thing couldn't handle the full Panzer Skrek, and damn if I didn't have the little psychopath's best interest at heart. I had correctly assumed that the police, EMTs, fire trucks and debris clearing department whatever they're called would have blocked off the road so that they could clear it. Which meant that the cultists assumed that our only way out was the south exit, meaning they were waiting for us to come out there, and not the north. Because clearly no one would be crazy enough to go out of the north lot now. My evil plan had succeeded. Somehow, both Buddy and I passed our driving checks to get past the really fucked up road, burning wrecks of cars, and police vehicles. Susie really only had to fire the Panzer Forst one. We had made it, we thought. Unfortunately for us the GM wasn't going to have us win that easily. One of the cultists had seen us leaving from across the street and immediately set out in pursuit. One fired an RPG and hit Chuck's truck behind us, which immediately did a flip and crash. Now, the professor and his wife were in that car, so we figured we couldn't leave them who also cares about allies anyways. I stopped my Pinto cruising wagon and I, Connie, Hobo Joe, and Susie all got out guns blazing and ready. We examined the other car and found that the professor, his wife, and Senator Fister had all miraculously survived, albeit at really low HP. Unfortunately, Buddy had died on impact. I stealthfully swiped the massive bag of weed he kept on himself, because I'd be damned if I let those cultists enjoy it. The cultists all pulled up their cars around us and got out, guns drawn, ready to kill. One of their priests approached us and offered us mercy if we surrendered then and there, because he admired our tenacity. Simultaneously seeing where that was going, and having my Nazi senses tingling, I immediately pulled the pins on two of my grenades and yelled back screw you nerds and throwing it at them with an excellent roll to boot. The survivors all crammed themselves into my car and we drove off. I personally think that it was thanks to my obscenely high luck score, but we somehow avoided all bullet fire. We drove down to the downtown area, desperate to lose them, and eventually we heard what sounded like the same inhuman screaming coming from the forest around the town that we heard when the brethren attacked us, as well as the sounds of something bigger. We looked around us and found that brethren and cultists were all attacking the populace, carrying off civilians and of course just killing them, leading to a civil panic. We also noticed that an absolutely massive eldritch horror had come into the town, and was hot in pursuit of us. Ignoring traffic and telling Connie and Susie to shoot everything they had at it, we were only just managing to stay away from it, but clearly wanted us to die way too much. I think it was at that moment when one of the cultists priests put a curse on my car, which caused me to immediately lose control and ram right into a bar. Unfortunately, Susie died on impact, because she wasn't wearing her booster seat I guess. Apparently you're supposed to make children wear seatbelts, who'd have guessed. The professor's wife also hadn't taken the impact well and was currently in the process of dying. While I let Connie, Fister and Hobo Joe deal with all that, I immediately ran to the bar and proceeded to smash every bottle I could and start setting the place on fire. The giant monster was right outside, along with about half a dozen fucking brethren who were in the process of rushing us, and a group of cultists was standing outside, assault rifles in hand. One of the brethren attacked me, but thanks to a good dexterity roll I was able to sort of roll it over me and right into a pile of broken glass and fire. Speaking of which, apparently bars burn down really well, 
because the place was a fucking inferno by the time we were about halfway done with dealing with the brethren. By then though, Senator Fister had passed out due to the sheer panic of the situation failed sanity roll and fell into some flame. Unfortunate, but one shouldn't cry over incinerated senator. What the fire did do was give the big bad monster a deterrent from reaching into the place to devour and or crush us to death. Damned convenient I thought. So, because he couldn't do this the GM decided to kill another bird, so to speak. The GM pretty much wanted my car dead from the very first time I fired a Panzerskrek, so he had the monster lean down and take a massive bite out of its back in order to begin the process of swallowing it whole. But the GM forgot something. I may have mentioned this earlier, but the reason why Pinto cruising wagons were so unpopular was not just because of the fact that they're absolutely hideous looking. I discovered rather recently that it was also because they had a tendency to explode rather violently if a large amount of force were directed towards the rear of the car, such as if it were rear-ended, or if some, oh I don't know, giant monster were to take an enormous bite out of it. And because my car was already filled to the brim with grenades, rockets and other such things, the explosion would have been enough to level half a city block if it were on the ground when it blew up, as opposed to right by what I assume was the monster's face. The look on the GM's face was priceless when he found this out, but he couldn't do anything about it, and due to the absolutely massive amount of damage dealt to the giant monster it died immediately. This event caused so much shock and awe in the cultists, that it gave me the perfect opportunity to instead take charge of things going on here. Connie and I shot dead three of the four cultists across the street. Hobo Joe restrained him. Those fuckers took my Pinto cruising wagon, the thing filled with what the Fuhrer himself had directly asked Herz Knitzelnazi to keep safe. Just like to clarify that I am once again role playing here. The GM didn't even make me roll for an intimidate check, which was good because my score was abysmal there. Apparently I am so full of rage that the cultist can't help but tell me what I want to know. I demanded to know where that fucking priest was who made me lose control of my goddamned car was. The others in the party immediately didn't know what I was doing, but I'd be damned if I was going to let that bastard get away with it. Escape didn't matter to me anymore. This was personal. The cultist didn't know, but he did have the phone number of the priest. After thanking him and ordering Hobo Joe to murder him in whatever way seemed fit to a deranged hobo, I took the phone and impersonated the cultist. I bluffed that the enemy's ass were trying to hunt him down so that he couldn't put any more curses on their cars as they tried to escape. He then told me that he was hiding out at a certain gas station within the city, and he ordered us to retreat to defend him, and gave us his location. I told Connie and the others that this was our only hope of killing the cultist priest and with him dead we might be able to put a huge damper on whatever the fuckers were planning. I told them that they should attack the guy from the front, while I went in from the rear. They went along with it and I stole some guy's bike from a bike rack and went off. In truth, I was lying to them as well. I wasn't going to attack from the rear. No, that fucker is responsible for my car's fiery and glorious destruction. He doesn't deserve to simply be gunned down. I had to kill him with fire and blood. I started sending private messages to the GM telling him my plan in secret, and at this point I think he actually wanted me to do this. So as Connie, Hobo Joe and the professor who was in a murderous state at the loss of his wife at this point played out their attack on the gas station. I rode the bike over to an airfield that I say on our way into town. I went over and found the largest helicopter that I could, judo kicking the pilot who was trying to flee at this point away from it. After hot wiring it, I started to fly to where my GPS told me the gas station was. Fortunately I actually had pilot as a skill. I will never forget the looks on everyone's face when the GM said through the hail of gunfire and violence, you hear the unmistakable sound of a large helicopter approaching. As you look up you notice that it appears to be heading for a direct impact for the gas station. As realization suddenly dawned on the players and the cultists alike, I jumped from the helicopter after with my parachute. After securing the shaft so that it could not avoid hitting the gas station directly. Thing about gas stations is that when they explode, they explode big. Everyone around it was probably vaporized if I had to guess. Now I personally thought that I needed to distract the cultists. Otherwise they might have seen the helicopter coming too early and escaped. But I also honestly thought that the others wouldn't have been so close and would have been outside of the radius of the explosives. Or that is that maybe I forgot to tell them. I was also surprised when none of them were really mad at me, even though I killed all of them, and the professor. I guess they thought it was a hilarious way to go, so the game ended as I stood at the top of the building surveying the wreckage. Though fire and blood was wrought, I was the lone survivor of the party. Was it worth it? Fuck yeah it was. 
and that was fire and blood everyone. Sometime within the next day or so I will be releasing the next story in the order, which is the pig rose. Quest Selnazi will return soon. We last left off the game with me being the only surviving party member, and no one within the state we were in who could translate the texts that we needed. We were two children, a camp counselor, a senator, his bodyguard, a mentally challenged redneck, a hobo, and an African warlord down, and I needed to fill my ranks once again so that I could continue my crusade. You see, with the destruction of his car, the cultists made this battle personal, and he wasn't going to stop until every single one of them Scientologist commie Mathefakas was dead. My first step was to roam the ruins of the town and look for suitable survivors who would be willing to assist me in my crusade. Wasn't too easy, as most of the town's populace was either killed, ran away, or rendered irreversibly insane in the battle between us and the cult monsters. The GM had all of the other players start rolling up characters who would act as survivors in the town. The president of the tabletop club, aka Gobbledick and Hobo Joe's player, made a character named Sergeant Jackson, a marine whose tour of duty recently ended and lost his wife in the recent battle. The president's girlfriend, aka Chuck and Buddy the camp counselor's player who for some reason would only play as male characters, but hey I don't judge made the character of Josephy, the mustached eastern European man whose smoothie store was destroyed in the battle. She described him as a short and broad-shouldered man with a mustache that would make Mario and Joseph Stalin blush. The girl who played both of the child characters decided to mix things up here, and this time play as a teenage girl. This was Tiffany Goldstein, a 16-year-old girl whose boyfriend and entire family were killed at the gas station. She fortunately didn't know that it was Hersknit Selnazi who flew the plane. Senator Fister's next character was Wolf Staggs, the hardcore survivalist who just happened to be in town when it was attacked, and who was also staying in the hotel that we were at, which apparently caught fire not long after the battle started. And then there's Connie's character, my best friend at my university. I had no idea what he was going to do, and so when we were walking to the meeting place together I asked the guy and what he told me, I had to admit, was pretty fucking good. He was playing as Jason Knight, the ghost hunter. He was a man who ran one of those ghost hunting TV shows, so he always had his camera on him. He filmed the entirety of the battle, and wanted to head out with me for the views. So, on to the adventure. I went to each character one by one and started gathering them. By the time I got all five together, we were in one of the many abandoned bars in the town. I was behind the bar, making drinks for everyone. When I was all done I stood on the bar. Dirty Schween have taken things from all of us. Back in the 1930s and 40s we had a similar problem. Trouble is that I can't remember who was responsible. Could it have been the Scientologists? The Vietnamese? Commas? Fucking Mormon. I don't know. But whoever has done this to us is going to pay, aren't they? The others were all quite enthusiastic about murdering the cultist. Excellent men of Froon. I know what we're up against, and I have some of the means and the will, but I need you. You will be my soldiers and I your glorious Fura. Together we shall sweep across this cult, crushing all in our path. And we shall create a world free from the this cult of commies for a thousand years. After my inspiring speech, we hotwired three undamaged cars and took them back to our camp. We also found that on their way out of the town, the cultists had resurrected the dead civilians to cover their escape. I think I personally scored a new record in zombie roadkill. When we got back to the camp, the kids were all really broken up about the death of Connie. We held a small tasteful funeral, something that those that fell during fire and blood would have appreciated. After the funeral preparations were made, we spent a lot of time trying to come up with what to do next. We knew that in order to defeat the cult and its master, this god in the lake, we had to understand it better. Only problem with that was that everything we stole was in a language that none of us could read properly. And the only person that we knew of that was in the state of Montana had been incinerated by. Well that's not really important okay. We also couldn't infiltrate the cult, because they had to invite people to join their commune, like we were at first. I don't know why I started thinking about it, but I remembered that demon that I had accidentally summoned. I recalled that the way the GM described it, made it sound exactly like one of the stars born of Great Kthulhu, which meant that I was evoking the words of Kthulhu. I suddenly realized that there were Kthulhu cults everywhere, and that we could get one of them to read the texts. The group looked at me like I was nuts. Why would they help us, and there are no Kthulhu cultists around here, they asked. They will be, because they are going to come here, I said. I felt bad for doing what I was about to do. Even Hersknitzelnazi had limits to the depths of depravity that he was willing to sink to. 
but I knew there was no other way. We had to make a disturbance big enough for Kthalhu, in his ever dreaming state to notice. We asked one of the other camp counselors to take up the job of reading the eulogy for the PCS that die. Taking a hint from the director's cut of the tales of old man Henderson, we set up a projector for the entire camp to say certain lines of prayer along with one another. While they were doing this, we were all extremely far away, and for good reason. All 200 of the kids and camp counselors said those exact summoning words that I said so long ago. Bring in 200 hundred of the stars born of Kthalhu to the immediate area. The demons immediately started massacring everything in sight. And when everyone was dead they turned on each other. I felt so bad that I did this, even in the game. But it was truly the only way. By the time everything in the camp was good and dead, I lit up a joint in order to commemorate all of the children and friends who died so that the world could be saved. About a week later, we laid low, staking out some of the surrounding, non-obliterated, towns, listening for rumors. We of course heard things like, I heard that an entire summer camp was massacred by wild animals, or I heard that some town just got destroyed. Some people said they saw an SS officer there, but, eventually we heard a rumor that a rather large group of strangers was coming around town and asking about the massacre that took place at the summer camp. The plan had worked. Then began phase 2 of my master genius plan. We had also been preparing the area by making various bombs, smoke grenades, pyrotechnics, and setting up extremely expensive surround sound systems around the gathering area at the camp. When the Kthalhu cultists came to check out the area, we were there waiting for them. When the cultists arrived, we first set off the smoke bomb, and then started playing Gangnam Style. Our campaign was set in the very specific year of 2012 and it was the most annoyingly catchy song that we could think of. Then, with the cultists all confused, we proceeded to set off the explosives and fire traps right there. Additionally, because of the layout of the area, they couldn't really easily escape out of the bowl of death. According to the GM, right then and there more than half the cultists were dead, and the survivors had absolutely no idea what was going on, and were highly disoriented. It was at that moment that the spits were inserted. Jason, Wolf and I approached them from one half of the bowl of death, and Sergeant Jackson, Josephie and Tiffany all attacked from the other half. We took exceptional care to leave only one survivor, who was a teenage girl, no older than Tiffany. We thought she'd be scared, but the zealous girl immediately pulled out a glock and started firing on us. Thankfully Wolf came up from behind, disarmed and subdued her. Then the interrogation began. I looked the girl dead in the eyes and rolled a critical success on Intimidate. Being so scared that she actually pissed herself, the girl agreed to assist us. She read through all of our papers that we could procure and told us everything that we needed to know. According to her, the god in the lake was not actually physically in the lake. Well he was, sort of. It was sort of like his spirit would. According to her, the god in the lake is one of the great old ones, and came to earth not long before great Kthalhu did. The gods did battle and it resulted in Kthalhu's victory and successfully destroying his physical form. But ever since then, the spirit has been trapped in that lake, and has spent so long trying to get out once again. To do so, it needs human cultists. According to the notes written by Director Scott, the head of the cult, they needed human cultists who hadn't become the mindless brethren. For ritualistic and more mindful purpose, the brethren were actually a sort of larval form of greater monsters, which they would one day become. That thing that we saw come out of the lake so long ago was one such greater monster. We also discovered that the gigantic monster that attacked us in the city was what happened when the essence of the god mated with a human female. We thanked the Kthalhu cultists, but decided to keep her with us. Until our job was complete, we decided we liked her, and wanted a few more adventures with her. And thus ends the pig rose. I will come out with the incident with the boats probably around tomorrow or the next day. Take care my lovely fans, and enjoy. We're getting to the end game baby. Hesknit Selnazi will return. We last left off our story when our heroes captured a teenage girl Kthalhu cultist, and learned more about this mysterious god in the lake. And it was one of the few notable events where one of us didn't die. Unfortunately some 200 children, counselors and workers at the camp did die though. But to Hesknitz their deaths were necessary sacrifices to continue his crusade. At this point, we would spend most of our time trying to devise ways to kill a god's spirit. Unfortunately, we had a lot of difficulty thinking of any. I believe that it was Jason Knight the ghost hunter, who came up with the idea. It was essentially god in lake, god no leave lake, god need lake to live. We make lake no more, we make god no more. That presented us with another problem though. How can you kill a fucking lake? 
Even with all of the firepower Hairs Knit as he once had, it wasn't enough to actually destroy a lake, let alone a god that lives within it. At this point, the commune cult had become rather desperate to stop us, and had also been expanding their numbers drastically, recruiting from all over the country in an effort to accelerate the resurrection of their god. This presented more problems than the obvious, as cultist attacks had become a fairly normal thing, as well as attacks by what we called big brothers. Those are the things that came out of the lake in the first session. Seeing how brethren turn into them eventually, and due to their massive size, we figured that the name was appropriate. Things weren't getting easier at this point, but our activity had another unexpected effect on the state around us. Seeing how we completely obliterated a fairly large town at one point, and how we've continued to wage battles in other populated areas in other sessions, and also how an entire summer camp was completely massacred by unknown creatures, Montana had gone into a sort of state of emergency. That's even one way that the cult was gaining members, they proclaimed to be a safe haven for people to seek refuge at. We tried to curb their reputation with rumors that they are responsible for the destroyed towns, monsters and magic, but they were just way better at it than we were. We had done a better job at securing a base around the old camp though, had plenty of food, water and electricity, and had set up monitoring stations, and listened and watched TV constantly to pick up on the news. Sergeant Jackson sat would constantly listen to military frequencies to learn about their movements. Volstags would scout around the area, trying to learn of the cult's doings and watch their progress. Josephie made us some pretty fucking good smoothies. Tiffany also spent an obscene amount of time on Tinder trying to get rebound sex to make up for the pain of her murdered boyfriend and parents. Still completely unaware that I was partially responsible. And Jason Knight used his TV show to try and promote conspiracy theories about the commune. We were despairing at this point, we couldn't figure out what to do. At this point we almost thought that the cult would win. But then, Sergeant Jackson heard over one of the military frequencies that with all of the freaky stuff that's been going on in the state. The military is planning on relocating some of the nuclear weapons to more safe locations. That's when we got the idea on how we were going to obliterate the lake. When I told the others about this, they were for some reason apprehensive about the idea of setting off a thermonuclear device. They also pointed out that if we do steal it, then the entire might of the United States military was going to be on our asses in seconds. We'd probably end up getting our own satellite. I convinced them by saying that it was our only chance for revenge, because at this point, our only options were to run away and do nothing while the god in the lake rises to kill us all, or sit on our asses here and have them kill us before the god in the lake rises. Not long later, the others were in business, and we had our plan all ready. The nuclear weapon was being transported down a fairly major river in order to make it to a railway, and was under exceptionally heavy. We could never catch up to it near a railroad, so we figured our only chance was to get it at the river. We also didn't need the entire missile, we only needed the warhead, which would be rather difficult to get, but it would be easier than moving a missile. Pooling our funds together, we managed to manage to buy an extremely high quality speedboat, which we rode out into the scheduled river three days before the move was scheduled to happen. We stayed on the boat and hid in it in the brush near the river bank just deep enough for us to start up quickly. When the boat arrived, we finally understood the definition of what the US military meant when it said under heavy guard. There were several Apache attack helicopters flying overhead, tanks and Humvees patrolled along the road next to the river, and at least six patrol boats armed with mini guns and missile launchers escorted the large vessel used to transport the missile itself, and we counted dozens of guards on board a ship itself. All this, and whoever knows what other deterrents our GM might have come up with. Things were not exactly looking up for us at this point. We decided that going all pirate on the boat was not exactly an option for us at this point. That's when we decided to go with plan B. We decided to abandon our super expensive speedboat in favor of something else. The boat was moving at night, which made this far easier than it could have been. We all got out one of those scuba jets, which would allow us to get up to the boat in time. Wolf and Sergeant Jackson went for one of the patrol boats and killed the crew on board. Meanwhile, Tiffany, Jason, Josephie and I all scaled up the side of the boat and started sneaking our way through. Josephie had a lot of experience with engines, and went out to disable their engine, hoping to move attention away from the cargo. This worked as the guy rolled a critical in his attempt, making it look perfectly like an accident. While the crew was busy with this, I led the others to the direction of the missile. Josephie was invaluable here and did a perfect job of getting the warhead out without spilling a shit ton of radiation to kill us. Tiffany's phone, however, went off during one of her stealth rolls, which alerted the guards to our whereabouts. 
I shot and killed the guards, but apparently gunshots are extremely loud. More guards arrived and we got into a massive shootout. Military personnel are also far better at fighting than cultists are, and we quickly found ourselves getting overwhelmed. Having prepared for this, I attached a 15 pound block of C4 to the wall behind us, and we all took cover. After throwing a smoke bomb and 3 stick grenades into the room, covering our escape and killing a few marines in the process, the 4 of us ran out of the hole I had made. Josephy, Tiffany and Jason were all pretty badly injured during the fight, but I somehow managed to evade being hit. I personally apply that to Hairs Knitzelmazi's uncommonly high dexterity score. We ran from along the edges of the ship. I pulled a Henderson and Judo kicked a guard who tried to take us prisoner off the ship. Thank you again dexterity. The others turn jumped off the ship, but before I could, I found nearly all of the ship's guards right behind me. I raised my two middle fingers and said Sega Heil motherfuckers and then slipped over the edge, losing only three hit points in the process. The other patrol boats and helicopters were searching furiously for us in the water, but we stealthily made our way over to the patrol boat which Jackson and Wolf had procured, getting ready to distract the military. We detonated some of the charges that we had placed on our fancy speedboat, which immediately drew the attention of every helicopter and boat in the river, which allowed us to escape without nuclear warhead completely unmolested. The military also didn't go looking for the boat because they just assumed that it went out to secure the river. In actuality, we learned via Google Maps that the river we were in was connected to the lake. Damned convenient. Tiffany watched the news on her phone, and they reported that a nuclear warhead was stolen, but the terrorists who stole it were all mostly likely killed when their boat caught fire and exploded. We doubted the military really believed that, but were just trying to get people not to panic. We made our way back to the lake not long later. It was a good time, and we had to figure out a way to detonate a warhead, but that could be done later. Maybe we could kidnap a nuclear scientist or something. That's when the cultists showed up. Oh yeah, you thought the incident with the boats was all over didn't ya? The cult had heard about what had happened, and immediately suspected us, and prepared an ambush. A dozen speedboats that the cult apparently owned came out of nowhere, their guys armed with their assault rifles some heavy machine guns, and even a few rocket launchers. To make matters worse, we also noticed some of the brethren swimming around in the water, attempting to climb on board our ship, as well as other eldritch horrors beneath the waves. The cultists got the drop on us, and damaged the ship. Unfortunately for them, it was equipped with miniguns and missile launchers, which helped us damage their number. But even when we hit back with those, the cult hit back again. They used some of their magic to curse our ship, making things break and jam, and other unfortunate things happened to us. Wolf was hit with a lucky shot by one of the cultists and went down to die. Even me, with all of my medical knowledge couldn't save him. Things were hard, but after all of us being pretty badly injured, we managed to wipe out the last of the cult. That's when I decided to give the cult another fuck you moment. I dropped off the others at the shore by the camp. That's when I wired every missile and round on board the boat to go up. Then I started the boat up, and jammed it into maximum acceleration on a direct course for the commune. Hesknitz Selnazi jumped off the boat not long after starting it and swam to shore. We then watched as the boat, moving at a surprisingly fast speed, ram ashore by the commune, and immediately blow up, giving us an explosion that we could see clearly all the way across the massive lake. And that's the incident with the boats everyone. I hope you enjoyed, and are looking forward to when Hairs Knitzelnazi returns for his final adventure. Killing the gods. I should get that one out tomorrow, or in a few days at the very latest. Farewell everyone, we're almost done. If you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop!